many home health care devices have you dealt with in the last couple years? Maybe you haven't used them personally, but if you pause and think of it, you can probably come up with a lot of different devices, right? Did you know that the global home medical equipment market is projected to reach over $55 billion by 2030? Home health care is certainly one of the hottest topics in electronic engineering today. But what do you need to consider when you're designing a home health care application? Oh, geez. Where do we start? Well, how about the power supply? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Bruce Rose from CUI Incorporated and I explore the various safety certifications and regulations needed for home health care designs. We examine the roles that temperature, isolation, and leakage current play in home health care power conversion and the additional requirements needed for power supplies for home health care applications. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from CUI Incorporated. Hi, Bruce. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Excellent. Okay, so home health care is a hot topic in electronic engineering today. And today we are specifically talking about power conversion for home health care. But Bruce, before we get started, are there any special design considerations we need to keep in mind when designing home health care products? The answer is yes that there are special design considerations I think everybody's aware of in power supplies for medical in general. When we go into home health care, certain aspects of it get a little more specific as to what needs to be done. And in the course of today's conversation, hopefully we'll cover all that. Excellent. Now, Bruce, I know that medical designs are subject to a lot of different regulations. Can you explain a bit about that part of the design process? Sure. When you do medical design, the concern is you have a patient who's probably or possibly immobile, and then you have others caring for that patient. And so there's concern to make sure that both the operator, those caring for the patient, and the patient themselves are safe from electrical shock. And so for that reason, there's definitions of operator protection and patient protection. And within those two levels, you can have one or two levels of operator protection, referred to as MOOP or pronounced MOOP, and that's means of operator protection. That's a little less strict than the patient protection because the understanding is the operator is mobile and can take care of themselves. With the patient, the assumption is that the patient may not be mobile and may not be able to take care of themselves. So the means of patient protection, M-O-P-P, pronounced MOP. The first one is MOOP for means of operator protection. For means of patient protection, it's MOP. And this is a little more strict, again, because the patient may require assistance. These guidelines are for any equipment that's within six feet of the patient in their medical care. That makes sense. Now, we also need to keep in mind the application itself when it comes to regulation, right? Yes. There are three categories of applications of this medical equipment. And the first one is referred to as type B, which means body. And this means it's not normally attached to or touching the patient. And one of the things electrically that's allowed to be done in this case is uh, AC safety ground can be connected to that equipment. Some examples of this type of equipment would be lighting, hospital beds, a video call device, that sort of thing where it's near the patient, but the probability of the patient touching it is not very high. The second category is referred to as BF, and this is body floating. And this is medical equipment that does touch the patient, but it does not have a conductive path to the heart. But this equipment is not allowed to have an AC safety earth ground brought into the equipment. Some examples of this type of equipment would be a blood pressure cuff, ultrasound equipment, things like that, where you can see, yes, it touches the patient, but it does not have a direct electrical connection to the heart. The third category is referred to as CF, which is cardiac floating. 
And this is equipment that will have a direct electrical conductive path to the heart, meaning probably it either is directly on the skin of the patient or maybe even internal to the patient during a surgery procedure. Again, the type CF equipment is not allowed to be connected to AC input safety ground. Some examples of this type of equipment, external would be a defibrillator, EEG, ECG, internal uh, dialysis equipment, or other stuff used for surgery procedures. Okay, so Bruce, what about safety? What kind of safety requirements do we need to keep in mind with these types of designs? Okay, and again, with all medical equipment, the concern is to make sure that we are not electrically shocking the operator or the patient. And so you're concerned about isolation voltages. And so you can worry about isolation voltages of the components, for example, transformers, opto isolators, Y capacitors. Those will be designed for certain isolation characteristics. Then the printed circuit board itself, you're concerned about what's called creepage distance, which is the distance between the conductors over the surface of the insulator, such as the printed circuit board base material. And again, that would be electrical current flowing along the surface of the device. Then there's also clearance distances. And this refers to the air gap between conductors, in which case there would be actually an arcing. And so there are specifications of the distances required for creepage and clearance. The distances depend upon whether it's a means of operator protection or a means of patient protection and whether you have one or two levels of that protection. And then the last thing I'll mention is that Y capacitors, it's a special class of capacitors that are designed in a particular manner to be used in these sorts of applications where safety is paramount. Bruce, are there any specific regulations when it comes to power that we need to be aware of here as well? With regards to power, what we're concerned about is leakage current because it's actually current that causes damage and danger to the individual. And so there are three categories, common categories of leakage current in medical products. The first one would be referred to as earth leakage current. And this is leakage current that goes in the ground return conductor of a type B piece of equipment. And normally there shouldn't be any current flowing there, but there will be just due to the design of the equipment, there may be some currents flowing there. The next category of leakage current that we're concerned about is enclosure leakage current. And with enclosure leakage current, this is if the operator or the patient touches the chassis or a conducting part of the equipment and current then flows through the operator or the patient to ground. The third type of leakage is referred to as patient leakage. And this is just due to the equipment being connected to the patient. There may be an inadvertent path of current through the patient returning to ground. And so There are, depending upon the type, whether B, BF, or CF, there are different levels of current that are allowed. And when you're doing the design, they look at whether it's under normal operating conditions or a single fault condition. So just like any other type of power conversion, we also need to talk about insulation, right? Correct. Insulation is an important factor of safety. And again, this is all to keep somebody from getting electrically shocked. And so there's two general common classes of insulation that we tend to see. One is referred to as class one, and this type has the AC input safety ground connected to the equipment. And so therefore, only basic insulation is present inside the device. If the basic insulation fails, then the ground conductor conducts the current away from the user. In class two, there is no safety earth ground present. And so you have two layers of insulation. You have basic and a second double layer or what's referred to as reinforced insulation. And as an aside, and we'll get to this a little bit later, home health care requires class two, that we aren't sure that ground is present always in a home environment, whereas in certain commercial medical environments, you can utilize class one equipment. What about temperature? I would imagine we need to consider temperature and humidity in particular in these types of designs as well. Okay, yes. So when we talk about home health care, and let's look at that because there's standard temperatures for commercial medical care, but when you talk about home health care, the concern is 
that it may not be as well controlled environment as is present in a hospital. Many homes may not have air conditioning. They may not have the same quality of heating. And so you have to be very careful when you're designing equipment for home health care that there may be extended temperature ranges over traditional commercial health care equipment that need to be adhered to. And similarly, humidity, that in parts of the country that humidity may not be an issue, but in many parts of the country in the world, Humidity is a great concern, either incredibly low humidity or incredibly high humidity. And again, the concern is that a home environment may not have as well of controlled temperature and humidity as would be present in a commercial medical setting. Something also to consider when we're talking about home health care, there's the concern while the individual is being transported, not just while they're in a home or a non-commercial health care facility. That makes sense. Now, with these kind of home healthcare designs, what input voltage are we talking about? Okay, so when we're going to talk about the commercial grid, the AC power grid, normally in the world, it's pretty well standardized that 100 to 200 volts AC is the acknowledged range. However, our problem can be deviations from that range due to what is referred to as load dump. If something's drawing a large current and suddenly stops drawing that current, it can cause a voltage spike. Or also, as the current runs through all of the conductors to get to the load, there will be resistance times current equals voltage. There'll be a voltage drop there. And so for that reason, you take that 100 to 200 volt range that was first mentioned, and for the load dump, concerns, you add 10%. So therefore, we take 110% of 240 volts AC brings us up to 264 volts AC. And then for the IR voltage drop, we multiply it by 0.9 or 90%, and it brings the 100 volts AC down to 90 volts AC. Now, that's for standard medical equipment. However, when we're in a home medical environment, again, we aren't sure that the power delivery may be quite as clean. And so therefore, home medical requires 85% at the low end, which is 85 volts. And similarly, if it goes into life support for home medical, it drops further to 80% or 80 volts. So Bruce, are there any other kinds of safety certifications that we need to consider? Oh, there's all sorts of other safety certifications, but the next one that we'll discuss here would be called ingress protection. And what this refers to is whether either solid objects or liquids get into your piece of equipment. And again, when you're in a commercial medical care facility, the intention is that there are trained people always present who are watching the equipment and operating the equipment and can ensure that items don't get poked into the equipment or spilled on the equipment. When you're in a home environment, the environment is not near as well controlled And so there's a concern there may be pets, there may be small children, there may be people who are just not aware of the situation. And so therefore, these IP ratings are listed as I, P, and then two numbers. The first number refers to how a solid may or may not be able to enter into the device. And the second number indicates how a liquid may or may not be able to enter into the device. And so in uh, home healthcare, The concern is that we do want to make sure that children's small fingers, pets' tongues, et cetera, can't get in and shock them. And similarly, if somebody spills their dinner or their drink or something, that the fluids do not affect the operation of the equipment. So therefore, there are higher IP ratings required for home health care than for commercial health care. I see. Now, what about shock and vibration? I would imagine that we need to consider the use of these kind of designs by a wide range of people and how they would handle them or mishandle them as the case may be. Yes, that is correct, Amelia. Again, in a commercial hospital environment, commercial medical care, the hope is that there are more trained personnel around watching the situation, making sure that bad things don't happen. In a home, we just don't have that luxury or that inconvenience, however you'd like to view it. And so it's more probable that something's going to get knocked off a desk or a table. Somebody's going to trip over a power cord, whether it be a children, a pet, whether it be a guest, it doesn't matter. 
nonetheless, the equipment falls. And so you have to be careful about shock when it strikes the floor or when it's, you know, stops dropping. And similarly, vibration is a concern because, again, we talked about earlier, it's not just while you're in the home, but you may be under home medical care while you're being transported. You may be going to the hospital to visit your physician. You may be going out shopping if you are mobile. Who knows what it is? But again, the vibration in a passenger vehicle probably is going to be more severe than sitting on a desk in a commercial healthcare environment. So yes, both shock and vibration requirements may be higher for home health care equipment. Excellent. Well, Bruce, what is the biggest takeaway you'd like my audience to remember from today's Chalk Talk? We've been familiar with designing for commercial health care for many, many, many years, and that has been the standard of what has been designed to. But especially with recently going through COVID, but with cost-cutting measures or cost-savings measures, there is a strong transition of health care in the home. And when healthcare is provided in the home, there is not the trained personnel around. So thus, the design requirements for medical equipment quite often still need to meet those that we're used to for commercial medical installations. But there may be additional requirements for home health care. And so the design engineer needs to be certain that they look at the requirements for home health care and make sure they're meeting those if that's what their equipment will be designed for. Excellent. Well, Bruce, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, thank you very much for hosting me. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from CUI Incorporated. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.